All right, well, hello everyone and welcome to this special Halloween edition of Physics 157. We have pumpkins and costumes. And I'm gonna start as usual by reviewing what we talked about last time. And so remember we were talking about various kinds of thermodynamic processes that we're putting together in a cycle. And we were saying that these kinds of cycles can be used in various useful mechanical processes to, for example, uh, drive a car. And so the basic idea is that we are taking some heat that in the car engine, for example, we're getting by burning fuel and we're partly converting that heat into mechanical work. And then that allows us to turn the axle of the car and make the car go. Okay, I think I'm gonna take this off at this point. And so let's kind of recall the specific thing that we wanted to analyze in that situation. We were looking at how much heat do you have to add during one of these cycles and how much work do you actually get out? And the ratio between the network that we get out for the cycle and the heat that we actually have to add, so the positive contributions to Q, that is defined to be the efficiency of our engine. Okay. And so we went through an analysis of not exactly the internal combustion engine cycle, but a good approximation to that. So what we call the auto cycle. And we found that after some kind of a little bit of a complicated analysis where we first found the temperatures at the various points, then we calculated the work for the various parts of the cycle, found the network, calculated the heat for the part B to C where heat is actually entering, where we're actually burning the fuel. And then we calculated the efficiency and it all simplified to this formula that efficiency is one minus one over the compression ratio raised to the power gamma minus one. And just to remind you, the compression ratio is just the maximum volume of your cylinder divided by the minimum volume. So that's always greater than one. And then gamma is this ratio of CP over CB. So what we learned was that in this cycle, what we want to do in order to maximize the efficiency, so in order to you know, get the most percentage of our added heat being converted into work would be to have as large of a compression ratio as possible. And so why don't we just have you know, an arbitrarily large compression ratio? So in the actual design of an engine, um, you know, there's some limit. Uh, real engines tend to have a compression ratio of around eight or 10. And the reason why we don't make it larger than that is that if you compress the gas too much during this, what will happen is that the temperature will get too hot and the gas will spontaneously ignite. And this is sort of uncontrolled. So remember in the regular internal combustion engine, what you wanna do is control the timing of when the fuel ignites. <clears throat> and you do that by compressing the gas and then having a spark plug spark and begin the reaction of burning of the fuel. Okay, so you want that to happen at a very precise time. And so in a regular engine, if you, if you have too much compression, what can happen is that the gas gasoline will ignite spontaneously at, <clears throat> at the wrong time. And then that, that can um, kind of mess with the functioning of the engine. So there's something called engine knocking that I remember hearing about in gasoline station commercials when I was uh, watching television as a child. Uh, so engine knocking is something that you want to avoid. And you do that by buying those fancier high octane fuels with the higher numbers at the gas station. Okay, so, so what that really is, is that if, if your engine isn't working properly and the fuel is spontaneously igniting, for example, if there's too much compression, relative to the ignition temperature of your fuel, then you have this problem. And these high octane fuels, so there's just a greater percentage of that particular molecule octane, 
what that means is that it ends up having a higher ignition temperature. And so you can have more compression without the spontaneous ignition of the fuel. And so some, some fancier cars are based on engines that allow higher compression and uh, are, are sort of using more of the energy in your fuel to, and converting it into work. <clears throat> okay, so, so that's, uh, that's basically the deal with those numbers. When you go to the gas station, um, if you have a car whose engine has a higher compression ratio, which, which is common in, in some of the fancier vehicles, um, then you need to get that higher octane fuel in order to prevent the spontaneous ignition of your gasoline in that compression step. Okay. So you might ask, well, why don't we just, you know, why do we need the spark plug? Why don't we just use that spontaneous ignition um, to run the engine? To, and in fact, there's the another kind of engine. Uh, so this type of engine, which we call a diesel engine, actually uses the spontaneous ignition of the fuel in order to in order to work, um, so the difference here is that again, in order to kind of carefully control uh, when that spontaneous ignition will happen, what happens is that in a diesel engine you don't inject the fuel before the compression. Okay, so in a diesel engine you have this adiabatic compression step, but now it's just air, so you get up to this very high temperature. <clears throat> And then at that point, once you're already at the smaller volume, you then inject fuel at a high pressure. And so you, you're injecting fuel continuously at a fixed pressure as the engine starts to expand. And because the temperature is always already very hot, then the fuel ignites as it's being injected. And then, um, and, and then we don't, you know, we can control when that happens because we control control when the fuel is injected, and we don't have to uh, use a spark plug to ignite the fuel. Okay, so that is, um, that is almost the same cycle, except instead of the constant volume process of, of having the spark plug <clears throat> um, ignite all the, the fuel once it's already all in there, here we're injecting fuel at constant pressure, and, uh, and that's igniting when it goes in. So it looks like that flat part. Okay, so uh, I have a few questions today, more questions related to these heat engine cycles and to kind of connecting that with actual car engines. So our first question actually has to do with a different way that we can use in order to calculate efficiency. I'll remind you that our definition is that you take the network for the cycle and then you divide it by the heat that goes in during the cycle. So there's an alternative way you can calculate that. And that, <clears throat> that's based on this question. So uh, think through this question for a moment, uh, pause your video, and, and then we'll talk about that. <clears throat> OK, so the question is asking, around a full cycle, we can say that the net heat flow, QH plus QC, so that's just the net Q adding up all of the Qs for the cycle. Um, and we want to know, how does that compare to the network? And so again, often when we're asked about heat, it's very useful to think about what the first law of thermodynamics tells us. And so we can write that Q is equal to delta U plus W that applies either to a single part of your process, a single process in your cycle, or to all of the processes together. You could just add up the, the works for the whole cycle, add up the heats for the whole cycle, add up the delta U's for the whole cycle. And it's still true that delta U equals Q minus W. Okay. So in this case, it simplifies because if we go around the entire cycle, then the pressure and the volume and the temperature of the gas after the whole cycle is going to be the same as it was at the start of the cycle. That's why it's a cyclic process because we keep coming back to the same internal state. And so delta U is going to be zero when we go around the whole cycle. We're going from some point back to the same point. 
And therefore, our first law of thermodynamics tells us that the net heat for the cycle is going to be equal to the net work for the cycle. So QH plus QC is equal to the net work for the cycle. And that allows us to simplify or rewrite our formula for efficiency a little bit. And so sometimes it's convenient, instead of calculating the work for all of the processes and adding up the works, um, we could alternatively write that the net work is equal to the net heat, which is equal to the positive contributions to heat plus the negative contributions to heat. And then we could rewrite that as one from the first term and then minus the absolute value of QC. So that's the absolute value of these negative contributions divided by QH. So that would be an alternative way. And this lines up nicely with the picture that we have here where we've got an amount of heat QH entering that comes from burning our fuel. Part of that is being converted to work. And then the remainder of that is this heat that's being expelled. And so we could think of efficiency either as the ratio of this work divided by QH or as one minus the ratio of this expelled heat divided by QH. Either one of those is, uh, is a, a valid way to calculate the efficiency of the engine. So depending on the information that you're given in the question, you might want to use one or the other of those. So here's a question just to process that. We're told that in a particular diesel cycle that the heat added in the combustion step is 3000 joules, while the heat expelled during the process D to A is 1800 joules. And we wanna calculate the efficiency of the engine. So take a few minutes to think about that and commit to one of these answers. And then now we'll talk about it. All right, so in this case, maybe I'll write something down here. So just to review, you can use our orange pen today for Halloween. Um, in this case, what we're told is that Q going in is equal to 3000 joules. Okay, so I'll just kind of tie in with this graphical representation of the energy flow that we had. Okay, so this was W, this was Q H or Q in and Q C. And what we're told is that 1800 joules flows out. And so basically we actually don't need to do any more calculations we're actually given all of the information that we need to calculate the efficiency. And so we could just say that the efficiency is equal to one minus this QC divided by QH, which is equal to one minus 1800 over 3000, which is equal to 0 0.4. Okay. So alternatively, we could have said that since 3000 joules goes in and 18 joules of heat goes out, then it must be that 1200 joules of work is being done. And so we could have also calculated that E is equal to 1200 divided by 3000, which also gives us 0 0.4. All right, so let's jump to another question. And this one relates these parameters that we're talking about for one of these thermodynamic cycles to the actual to the actual um, parameters of your engine. So when you read about cars, then you know it's not they're not telling you about what is the net work that your car engine cylinder does per cycle. When you read it when you go to buy a car, it's like this car uh, has, 100 horsepower and it runs at so many RPM. There's some range of different RPMs that it would run at. And so we want to 
understand how are those things that you read about when you're reading about cars related to these properties that we're calculating when we're analyzing these thermodynamic cycles. Okay, and so here we're saying we've got this diesel engine car. It has six cylinders. Okay, so there's there's actually six of these cycles going on at the same time. The engine is running at 3000 RPM and we wanna know how many horsepower is, is this, okay? And so what does this mean? The horsepower, it's basically, it's just a measure of power, okay? And so it's referring to how much work is done in, in the, by the engine per time, okay? So the net amount of work done by the entire engine, all six cylinders per time. Uh, the RPM is related to how many cycles are happening. And so the way that that's related is that basically every time you have one engine cycle, okay, remember that actually corresponds to the piston going up and down twice because there was the, the sort of power stroke when, you're, when you ignite the fuel and it goes down. But then there's this extra step where you send the exhaust out and suck in new fuel. Okay, And so you have two of these up and downs per each thermodynamic cycle in our auto cycle. And so in the actual car engine, every time the piston goes up and down, that rotates the axle around one time. Okay, so one cycle corresponds to two revolutions. All right, so your job is to process all of that, put it together, and then tell me what is the horsepower of this engine that I'm describing? Okay, so let's kind of, let's think through this. Um, so why don't we start with the fact that the engine is running at 3000 RPM. And so if we if we convert that, um, we're, go we're going to first talk about how much power we're getting in watts. And so that'll be an energy per, per second. It'll be joules per second. And so it's useful to figure out, like first, what is revolutions per second? So this is revolutions per minute. And we just have that divided by 60. And that will be the revolutions per second. OK, and so if I do the math there, then we get it's 50 revolutions per second. The question then says that one cycle corresponds to two revolutions. So if you want to know how many of these thermodynamic cycles happen for each cylinder per second, what we do is divide by two. So we get 25 um, cycles per second for each cylinder. And then we look at the information that says the network done per cycle is 1200 joules. <clears throat> and so for each cylinder of our car engine, we're going to have 1200 joules times 25 cycles per second. And so that works out to, so multiply by 100, and divide by four, Sorry. so that would be three, 30,000 um, joules per second or watts for each cycle. Did I do that right? Yep, okay. And now we have to take into account that there's actually six of these cylinders all working at once, okay? So this is the work done by one of the cylinders. This is the power um, produced by one of the cylinders and we have six cylinders. <clears throat> and so that would be 180,000 um, joules per second or 180 kilojoules per second, or that's equivalent to 180 kilowatts. Okay. And now finally, we have to do a unit conversion. So we're given that one kilowatt equals 1.33 horsepower. And so we, finally get um, 
that this is equal to 180 times 1.33 <clears throat> horsepower, and that works out to approximately 240 horsepower. Okay, so that is uh, that's our final result. The answer is D, that the engine is a 240 horsepower engine. Okay, and and so you know if you look at actual cars, um, probably the most common for the less expensive cars in an internal combustion engine vehicle is a, is a four cylinder engine. And then some of your fancier high performance cars will have six cylinders or eight cylinders or even 12 cylinders for some, some very fancy sports cars. Okay. The other thing you'll, you'll actually read about is, is the, uh, you'll see that engines have a certain number of liters, like a, a four liter engine that would be a, a a big engine. And so that's just the total volume of all the cylinders in your car. Okay. So you can, you can actually look up for the various cars out there, um, all of the detailed parameters. You can even, you can look up the, the volume of your engine, the compression ratio, the horsepower and so forth. All right. So I wanted to just mention, uh, this other kind of a cycle, this, this Stirling engine, um, where, instead of actually burning fuel inside the cylinder, we can run an engine by using an external reservoir of heat. And so I went through this cycle the other day in class where we have say a hotter object over here and a cooler object over here. And then we can use the hotter object as our source of heat. And then the cooler object is where we expel heat into and so we, we go through this cycle um, following the steps of the process that I went over previously. And we understood that, again, because it's a clockwise cycle, the network is going to be positive for this cycle, basically because the work in this process is larger in magnitude than the negative work here. Okay, so the work is the area inside this um, curve on the PV diagram. And so we're able to actually do some positive, do some network. Um, and here the heat is just being supplied by our hot reservoir. Okay. Um, so this isn't uh, particularly useful in a car engine, but it could be in a source, if you had a situation where you had a natural source of heat, um, like maybe some kind of geothermal activity is, is making um, some body of water hot or, or some, some rocks um, hotter than the environment. And then you could actually run an engine based on that natural heat source. So I actually wanted to, to do a demo here and show you uh, an example of a working version of this um, of this Stirling cycle you, that kind of uses something very much like the Stirling cycle, where we have a hot reservoir and a cold reservoir, and no fuel is actually being burned inside the cylinder. Okay. So let me uh, let me go to this demo and just pause that for a moment. Go to full screen and uh, here we go. All right, so hello everyone. Welcome to the physics demo room. This is in behind the lecture theater where we normally have our classes. And today what we've got is an interesting piece of equipment, which is called a Stirling engine. And so what's going on with this is that it's a machine that's going to convert heat partly into work and the work is going to be used to turn this propeller around. And so basically the heat here is coming from a hot reservoir on the bottom here. I've been heating this up with an alcohol burner and there's also a cold reservoir. Uh, this part has a lot of surface area so it radiates away the heat effectively and stays cooler than the bottom part. And so the Interesting thing is that there's absolutely no fuel inside this engine. So the only thing we're doing is warming up the bottom part. And so what's going to happen, hopefully, is that if I, if I start this thing turning, then just the, the heat from the bottom is going to actually be enough energy to keep this thing going. So here we go. And it does seem to be going pretty well. Okay, 
so it's it's actually just taking our energy from heat and turning it into work. Okay, and now the, the amazing thing is that you might think this is going because I'm burning the fuel, but let's now take the fuel away. Okay, so it's still going fine. It's just that this bottom thing is much hotter than the top thing. And so the machine is actually taking some of that heat and converting it into another kind of energy, which is the work that's necessary to turn this around. Now, eventually when that bottom part cools down, then there won't be enough heat left to continue making the engine go. But clearly it's actually working pretty well, even though we took the candle away quite a while ago. There we go. So that's a, that's a lovely Stirling engine. Okay. So let's make it safe to get rid of that. Bring back up our slides here. <clears throat> okay, so so that was a that was a an engine based on a process that was very similar to this process, where we have a hot reservoir where we're taking heat from that, and we're sort of expelling some of the heat into the cold reservoir, and overall we're doing work in the cycle. So there's actually a really interesting thing that we could imagine based on the same cycle, but just reversing the directions of all the arrows. Okay. And so imagine that I consider this reverse cycle. And so then we can calculate, well, how much heat is going into various parts and how much work is being done. And so in this case, what we would find is that the gas does a net negative amount of work in the cycle. It's just the negative of this case. Um, but what happens that's interesting is that we're actually drawing heat out of the cold reservoir and placing it into the hot reservoir. And so by actually doing work on the gas in this cycle, what we can do is keep something cold. So because we're actually taking heat out of the cold reservoir, that means it'll, it'll be a way of maintaining the cold temperature of that cold side. And so this is actually a principle that we could use to build a refrigerator. So I have a question here. Uh, it's again, based on this cycle, but done in reverse. What I've shown here is actually the key step for our refrigeration process. And so I want you to think about this question. If I pull up on the piston in this case where say it's zero degrees, with a cold reservoir and the gas is already cool, what happens if I pull up on the piston and I'm going to do it slowly so that the temperatures are remaining the same? Um, what happens, what can we say about heat during this, situ during this process? Um, so choose one of the answers, but also think about what is the argument that you can give as to why your answer is correct. And then finally, see if you can calculate if there is heat that flows, how much heat? Okay, so let's talk through this one. And what we have in this step is the statement that the temperature is zero all the time. So it's an isothermal process. And so that means that, well, because delta T is zero, we can say also that delta U is zero. And so then when we're asked about heat, it's always natural to write down the first law of thermodynamics. And in this case, because delta U equals zero, our first law tells us that Q is going to be equal to W for this process. In this process, the gas expands. 
And so that means that implies that W is going to be positive. So the gas is doing work in this situation. And so that means that Q is going to be zero. And so then heat flows in to the gas. And so that means that heat flows out of the system on the left and into the gas. And so in this step, as we expand the gas by pulling up on the piston, we're actually drawing heat out of the cold reservoir. Okay, and so that would be a way, um, for example, of if, if heat were entering that cold reservoir from, from the outside, you know, maybe it's something which is not, maybe this is the, maybe this zero degrees is the inside of a refrigerator, okay? And, and now the food in there, maybe someone opened the door and the food heated up a little bit and we wanna cool it down again. And so this process of having a, the gas expand in thermal contact with the inside of the refrigerator is actually a way to draw heat out of that refrigerator compartment and into your uh, into your into your gas here. In next class, we're going to talk about a real refrigerator and how that works. But this is basically going to be the process that we're going to have a gas that expands when it's in thermal contact with our fridge interior. Okay, so I'll say a little bit more about that. But let's actually work out the quantitative result that it's um, that's asked for in the extra part here. And so again, we can use that Q is equal to W. And in this case, what we want is to use the special formula for work for an isothermal process. Okay, so we have that, um, so we have that, let's see, I don't know. Okay, that's more visible. Uh, we have that, for an isothermal process, W is equal to NRT log of V final over V initial. Okay, and then basically we just have to plug in the various numbers from the question, okay? So our V final or v over V initial is four. So we have the log of four multiplied by our temperature, which should be in Kelvin, so 273 Kelvin, and then times, um, times our one mole, um, times the ideal gas constant, okay? And so looking at the details of that equation, if you plug it all in, you get 3,145 joules, okay? So let me just say uh, one comment about that. So, you know, one student asked a very good question, which was if the temperature is always zero outside and inside, um, you know, how do I understand the fact that heat is actually flowing from the cold reservoir into the system? You know, shouldn't there be no heat flow if, if we have that fixed temperature? <clears throat> and so that's, that's a really good point. Um, and actually, so it's just an, a kind of an approximation that if we do this very slowly, the temperature in the cylinder is never significantly colder than the temperature outside, but it actually is a little bit colder. And so the way to understand that is that if I pulled up very rapidly on the piston, um, then what would happen is that's, that's an adiabatic expansion where the work done by the gas is positive, Q is zero, and so delta U has to be negative. And so if you pull up very quickly on the piston, then actually that cools the gas inside the cylinder significantly. It's the opposite of when I push down <clears throat> adiabatically and heated up the gas and we were able to burn that piece of paper. It's the other way around. We pull up very quickly and then we could actually, um, we could actually um, get a large amount of cooling. And then at that point, what would happen would be that heat would flow from the zero degrees into our cylinder, which is colder than zero, until the gas inside the cylinder again reached zero degrees. Okay. So in an isothermal process, we're just doing this a lot slower. So you can imagine pulling up a little bit so that the gas cools down a little bit. Now heat flows from the zero degrees back into our gas to bring it up to zero degrees. And then we keep doing that. And so we're doing it in, in many maybe slow steps, always allowing our gas to get back up to zero. And so if we, if we do that very slowly, then the actual temperature of the gas in the cylinder it never really goes much below zero. But it is important that it does temporarily decrease, um, but we can control that decrease to make it as small as we want.
Okay, so isothermal is really um, something where we're keeping the temperature of the two parts very close. We can make it arbitrarily close to being equal, but it is sort of important that you have a temporary difference in temperature in order for heat to flow at all. Okay. Um, so that's, uh, that's basically the most important part of this cycle where we take heat in from the cold reservoir and that will help us cool the, the chamber on the left. The rest of the process in a refrigerator cycle is to get rid of that heat somewhere. So obviously we don't want to put it back into the cold reservoir. We wanna then send the heat into some other system in an actual refrigerator, what you're doing is you're taking heat out of the inside of the fridge and sending it out into the air behind the fridge. Um, and so that other reservoir here is our 20 degree warm reservoir. And so let's see what happens in the rest of this cycle. Okay, so we have the, the, the cooling step there. The next thing is that we want to insulate this gas from the inside of the refrigerator Okay, so we, we swap the two barriers. And so now the gas is in thermal contact with the hot reservoir. And so the first thing that happens here, if we keep this at fixed volume, then we'll have a little bit of heat that flows in from the, uh, from the hotter reservoir into our cylinder. But then we compress the gas in the next step. So we force this down. And again, by doing this, it would heat up if we just compressed it rapidly, but we're doing it relatively slowly. And so all of the energy that we're adding by doing work actually then flows out into the hot reservoir. Okay. And so this is now like most of the energy that was absorbed um, um, here by, from the cold system. Um, you know, now, now we're allowing that heat to flow into the warm system. And so when we, okay, so then when we put this in contact with the cold reservoir again, um, okay, so that's the final step. So we, we've allowed, we've compressed this, that extra heat has flowed into the hot reservoir. Now we swap the barriers again, and uh, it actually only takes a little bit of energy to cool, flowing to the left to sort of cool this gas down again. Um, so there's this one step where a little bit of heat goes back in, but it's not nearly as much heat going back in as we took out. And so overall, the total amount of heat that we took out of the cold reservoir turns out to be 27, 29 joules for that cycle. And then we ended up doing a net amount of work, 230 joules in the cycle. And so all of that, uh, that work that we did combined with uh, this heat that's come out of the cold reservoir that's then expelled into the hot reservoir. So that's all for today. And next time I'm going to tell you about the process in an actual refrigerator. Um, there you're actually moving the fluid around. Um, so it's not just a fixed cylinder. Uh, we're, we're actually, this, this fluid is moving around uh, through the fridge. So sometimes it is in thermal contact with the inside and sometimes it's in thermal contact with the outside. Um, and that's because it's actually physically in a different place. Okay, so have a good weekend, happy Halloween, and we'll see you on Monday.